Hi everybody and welcome to the Pervasive Media Studio Lunchtime Talk this afternoon. Thanks so much for coming. Um, these talks are live every Friday at one o'clock, um, both here in the building and online. So whether you're in Bristol or further afield, you can join the conversation. Uh, my name is Vic, Vic Tillotson. I'm um, Talent Development Lead at Watershed and I'm based in the studio here. Um, I am a uh, shortish white woman with a bob and brown glasses, green jumper, denim jacket and blue trousers. Um, every Friday we throw open the doors of Pervasive Media Studio for Open Studio Friday, where we offer you the chance to spend time in the space by hot desking alongside our residents and staff between 10am and 5pm. And especially a big welcome to those of you who are new to the studio or for whom this may be the first time you're engaging with us today. So welcome. Um, so what is Pervasive Media Studio? We're a diverse and collaborative community exploring creativity and technology with everything from comedy to coding and product development to performance art. It's a partnership between Watershed, University of the West of England and the University of Bristol and it's funded by Arts Council England. We offer studio space, um, desk space, meeting rooms, events, opportunities to our residents as part of our spirit of generosity and mutual exchange. And on Friday, we open the doors for other people to kind of come and join in with that. Um, and we're a space for people to take risks with early ideas and to make time for collaboration. So a quick bit of housekeeping before we um, kick off the talk this afternoon. Um, please feel free to move around the space, make a cup of tea, grab a glass of water from the kitchen, anything that you might need to do to feel comfortable. And um, we've got a quiet space just to the left here, just through that door. So if anyone needs to take a break or use that at any point, please feel free to pop through and do that. Fire exits are at either end of the studio, which is just over there. Um, one of the studio team will direct you to them should we need to. Um, accessible toilets and baby change can be found in the corridor just by the kitchen over there. Um, there's a Q&A at the end of the talk. Um, for those of you who are watching online, um, you can pop your questions in the YouTube chat. Um, Emma is our voice in the room today, sitting at the back there. And if you're in the building, you can just raise your hand. Um, you can get news on all our future talks by heading to watershed.co.uk forward slash studio at PM Studio UK on Twitter, or X, formerly known as Twitter, uh, at Pervasive Media Studio, at Mastodon Social on Mastodon, and at Pervasive Media Studio on Instagram. So, without further ado, <laughs> we're joined today by Ukai, who will share two projects that they've made within their mission to produce culture for what's coming. And we're really excited to welcome them here from Canada today, which is um, so lovely to have you here. Um, so please join me in giving them a warm welcome. All right, so uh, my name is Gerald McGrath. I'm the research lead at Ukai Projects. Um, our plan for today is that uh, I'll be sharing a little bit about the why of our work. I'll be turning it over to Louisa G, our studio lead, who will be talking a bit about the what of our work, and then turning it over to Kasra, who will talk a little bit about the how of our work. Uh, we are in from Canada, so if we make any social faux pas or cultural miscues, Please just raise your hand and let us know. All right, so uh, Ukai Projects was founded in 2017, and our mission is culture for what's coming. And so we're gonna talk through a little bit about what that means, and then look at some projects that relate to it. Um, it's a very long quote here, and I, I will read it out for you. Um, shipwreck is our sort of organizing principle for 2024. Uh, this is a quote from Jose Ortega y Gasset, who was a Spanish philosopher about a century ago. Uh, Life is in itself and forever shipwrecked. To be shipwrecked is not to drown. The poor human being feeling himself sinking into the abyss moves his arms to keep afloat. This movement of the arms, which is his reaction against his own destruction, is culture, a swimming stroke. But 10 centuries of cultural continuity brings with it, among many advantages, the great disadvantage that man believes himself safe, loses the feeling of shipwreck, and his culture proceeds to burden itself with parasitic and lymphatic matter. Some, discontinu uh, some discontinuity must therefore intervene in order that man may renew his feeling of peril, the substance of his life. All his life-saving equipment must fail, then his arms will once again move redeemingly. So obviously, despite some anachronistic language, um, the idea here being that culture is a way of responding to this existential sense of peril or panic. 
Um, over time, we develop these systems and approaches to make sense of the world around us. At some point, those adaptations cease to be adaptive, and we need some discontinuity to be introduced in order to reimagine how we organize ourselves to be with each other. So this is sort of the framework that we're going to be working from as we talk through today. Um, this is actually Ukai. And it's funny, because it's UK AI. When we're here, a lot of people assume it's like UK AI, or we have <laughs> infinite pronunciations of this. But this is actually Ukai here. Uh, Ukai, U is uh, cormorant, which are these black birds, and Kai means fishing. Uh, and so I first uh, experienced this when I was working as a relocation trainer in Japan in the automotive industry. And I, I was brought to a river to see this practice. And essentially what happens is they have this thing called a um, kagiri, which is like a, a, a basket full of burning pine. The burning pine draws ayu, the sweet fish, up to the surface. And then the cormorants gobble up the fish. However, the cormorants have a metal ring around their neck. So they can't swallow. And so their, their necks sort of fill up with fish, fill up with fish, until the usho in the boat pulls the rope, pulls the bird into the boat, flips them upside down, dumps the fish into a bucket, and then the fish are made available to eat. Uh, the first time I saw this, I didn't know what to do with it. Like, I'd never seen anything quite like it. And so I'm like, okay, what do I do, what do I do, what do I do? And when we're confronted by something confusing or uncertain, um, well, at least for me, I did something that I will regret forever, which is I judged it. I said, oh, well, it seems a bit cruel. And the friend that had brought me kind of gave an expression I couldn't really make sense of. And then I've been thinking about it for a very long time since. So the idea of, of ukai is a form of fishing. If, if you were to look to get fish for your family or for your household today, this would not be a particularly viable way of, of doing this. Um, but it has a very long tradition as an effective way of, of sort of feeding uh, a community. Also, wherever it's been practiced, the fish stocks have been sustained because they're not actually drag netting or they're, they're not actually uh, degrading the ability of that system to replenish itself. And as an experience, it creates this moment of sort of openness or uncertainty. And so a lot of our work is about trying to create these moments of not quite knowing what to do. Uh, and then inviting people to assemble their own meaning from that experience. Um, so this is, this is a bit about who we are. Now, a lot of our work is centered around cultural infrastructure. Um, infrastructure is something that we sort of by definition take for granted. Um, we develop habits over time, both mental and, and in the world around us in order to make sense of sort of this endless onslaught of, of sensory experiences that we have to process. So we start to like objectify differences in order to like function in the world. But over time, those adaptations can, um, well, so like Mikhail Bakhtin would call them the, the voices of the, the stories of the grandfathers. They, they can sort of stick around um, even when the world that we're in changes. And so when we talk about culture for what's coming, what we're talking about is the, the world that we're going to have in like 20 years or five years or 10 years is, is very different than the world we have now uh, and, and is quite different than the world we would have had 20, 30 years ago. But the culture that we are bringing into that future uh, is a product of our current assumptions. And so we're really interested in what we will need at the cultural level to be able to respond to things like rising authoritarianism, to ecological and political volatility, um, to, a, to a sort of a general uncertainty about how to be with other people in the world. Now, um, where are we at here? So yes. The, um, the other side of this is this idea that culture is a collective inheritance. It's a set of recipes we can draw on. And so things like ukai, the fishing practice, not the organization, um, were at some point determined to no longer be viable ways of sort of acquiring fish. And in the 1890s, ukai, that fishing practice, was a, a trend in New York. It was like this thing that you did, and all the fashionable people did it. And it was more, more elegant than falconry. And it was, but then, of course, it, was, it, it sort of faded away. And so culture is a sort of inheritance we can draw upon to be able to address problems. But if that set of recipes or that set of ingredients becomes overly narrow, uh, then we don't have as many recipes to pull upon. And if the conditions in the world change quite dramatically, 
then we will actually be at a loss uh, in terms of how we respond. So a lot of our work is about, um, it's less about trying to solve problems and more creating space where different solutions can be in dialogue with each other so that people can do the work of making their own sense of what's going on. Now, um, so landscape painting uh, came out of a period of time in which common land was being enclosed increasingly and people wanted to demonstrate their possessions. And so painting became a way of showing what they had. This is very much centered in the assumptions of capitalism. And as a practice, sort of landscape painting was an appropriate response to the times that they were in. Now, is something like this, is landscape painting going to be uh, a useful response to a world defined by sort of climate harm and by rising sort of political volatility? Not so sure, but as a form, it persists, obviously. And there are people that have a deep appreciation for visual art, no questions about that. Um, Dostoevsky, writing at the end of the 19th century, uh, was responding to the introduction of sort of industrial capitalism into Russia um, and its sort of um, collision with a traditional approach to, to you know, growing plants and agricultural life in rural communities. And so the novel, well the novel actually came out of like Rabelais and Cervantes and other about two centuries prior, but novels became a way of showing the collisions of different ways of knowing the world um, and providing people an opportunity to step into those systems. So again, we have a, a genre, a form of art, and this is less about the content and more about the structure, the infrastructure that, that sort of defines the art. Um, that arose from a need as different cultures were coming into collision with each other, particularly in Europe, and then it was exported elsewhere. Um, there's a, Brian Larkin is a, a, an anthropologist. He wrote about cinema, and you know, being where we are, I thought cinema would be an interesting thing to think about, but he looked at it from the perspective of northern Nigeria. And in northern Nigeria, cinema uh, served a, a critical role in sort of organizing people's lives. Like going to the cinema was, was more than just an opportunity to see a movie, much like Watershed here. Um, it was a chance to interact, to relate to each other in different ways. Um, but the problem was that it was in service to behaviors that the government, in first the colonial government and then the post-colonial government, were, were very unhappy with. And so cinemas were banned in northern Nigeria, not because of the content of the movies. That wasn't the problem. They were often movies that were state sanctioned, um, but because of the types of relationships that they engendered. And so this is what we're talking about when we talk about cultural infrastructure. Um, now, cultural infrastructure, and this work behind here, by the way, is a work by uh, the sculptor Pierre Huig um, called Variants. It's in Norway right now, definitely worth checking out. Um, but we understand sort of cultural infrastructure as a terrain of uncertain governance. So what that means is that when we build something like a cinema, um, we have our intentions, we have our hopes about what people will do in it and how they'll interact. But others step into that space and then they assemble meaning. Like they, they sort of determine what things mean to them. They inhabit that space in their own way. And every time someone else steps into that space, they do this work of sort of aesthetically constituting the space and making sense of it. And so we're interested in infrastructures that invite people to step into them and then figure out what it means for them. And we'll share a little bit about that in a, in a few minutes. So who is Ukai? I've talked a little bit about this. Um, right, so I have my notes here. We'll jump ahead here. All right, so two things. Culture for what's coming, the first we've talked a little bit about. Occupying the ruins is a second that Castor is going to be discussing a little bit more. Um, I should have maybe mentioned this up front. We are not anarchists, but we're sympathetic to anarchist philosophy. A lot of our work is organized around these ideas. So there's three sort of activities that define the work that we do. Um, the first is this idea of prefiguration. Uh, what this means is that we need to organize our relationships in ways that reflect the world we want. So this idea that we're going to have a peaceful future through violence, this idea that we're going to um, be able to have a, um, a caring future through, through cruelty, I mean, these are impossibilities. So a lot of our work is how do we start modeling the sort of structures and infrastructures that we want to see in the world in the present, um, rather than sort of designing towards those outcomes in the end. Uh, the second is this idea of polyphony. Uh, so we're not interested in, in one answer. We're interested in multiple voices, kind of like stars in the sky. And you look up and people can sort of make 
they can assemble their own pictures out of the, out of the stars that they see um, in the sky. And so when we do work, we tend to invite multiple contributors, multiple artists to uh, insert their work. And then audiences have to do the work of figuring out what it means. Maybe there are some works that they hate. Maybe there are some works that they love. But through that process of sort of making sense, um, we can begin to, to chart a path forward. And then finally is this idea of transvaluation, um, which was you know, espoused by Nietzsche originally, but, but Emma Goldman and others have really pushed as well. Um, transvaluation is this idea that we have systems that do one thing. And, and most of the systems that we're in, most of the infrastructure that we're in is organized around efficiency and size, making things bigger, making things faster. But there are other values possible that we can insert into these systems. And so we're really interested in what does AI look like if we put generosity or compassion at the middle? Because most AI right now is sort of built on these assumptions of modernity, that, that the future is going to be better than the present. And so we got to get there as quickly as possible. And if the future is not going to be better than the present, if that's no longer guaranteed, then accelerating to the future is, is kind of it's kind of foolish. Um, and so how do we start imagining other systems that we can inhabit where maybe other values are present in the work that we do? So this is a project uh, we did in Kensington Market in Toronto. We, everything in Canada, by the way, has its duplicate here. Um, and so Kensington Market is a wonderful, groovy little place in Toronto. Um, during COVID, it was a particularly hard hit because it, it relies really on interactions. So we did a number of projects in the market that would allow for people feeling isolation to engage with each other. And this was an infrastructural project where we built these, well, actually, the, the artist was Mina Rizwan. Um, she built these uh, booths that people could go into and have a conversation with a stranger in another booth, which was about 200 meters away within the market, but not within line of sight. Um, we understand infrastructure as, a, as an aesthetic act. Uh, what that means is that um, like any sort of system or room, when you step into a space like this, we're receiving messages. Like it's, it's speaking to us. It's trying to, to tell us things about how we're supposed to act. I'm up here standing. You're there sitting. So there's a sort of an implicit power relationship in the structure of the room that we're in. Um, and so we're, we're curious about how we can build infrastructure, particularly cultural infrastructure, that invites different kinds of interactions and different kinds of conversations. Ethics then becomes downstream from that because we can't decide whether a thing is good or bad until we actually do the work of making meaning from it. And so we, 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 although we, we are fans of this sort of ethical argument in, in the cultural space, we see there being a need to actually have conversations about what things mean first. Then we can start having conversations uh, about how we feel about them, sort of our moral positions on them. Um, OK, actually, so I'll stop there. Um, so what's going to happen next is Luis is going to share uh, a few of our projects that specifically talk about some of these elements. And then Castro will talk a little bit about the how. Uh, and then we'll come back uh, and share some opportunities to engage with this work. All right, so I'll turn it over to Luis. Hi. We all are good so far. Um, <laughs> My name is Luisa. Uh, I'm the studio lead at Ukai Project. And what that means is uh, kind of look at what the research lead um, who you just heard from um, have pulled from all these amazing research and develop ways that we situate ourselves and our work in different places and experiment with different ways we can insert values into things that already exist in the world. One of the things that we care a lot about is climate and the environment, um, but caring about something only goes so far. Um, and we want to navigate the world of how do we care for these systems that ultimately underpins our lives um, in different ways. So both as an organism existing in this world, but also thinking in terms of infrastructure of the digital world. Um, you know, we are connected through cables across the oceans. There are places that are hard to get to. Um, there are places that are in the prime climate scenarios where you build data centers. And as many of you probably know that um, if you look up the night sky, it's really easy to see constellations of 
satellites that's holding everything together <laughs> um, from GPS to a lot of military things going on. So these are coming from this earth, this environment, the night sky, the universe, um, but ultimately we're using it for our own comfort or our own selfish um, modernity <laughs> um, or, or goes to go into the future that was prescribed to us rather than from us. So this project is a residency that we did at a regenerative farm in Wakefield, Quebec in Canada. Um, the farm is transitioning out of the commercial growing um, operations and looking into creating you know, more edges to blend into the forest system that are nearby. Um, so we brought three artists um, to inhabit the space and from that time they derived their own works in response to the relationship between what they experienced in semi-wildness <laughs> um, and what they observe from the systems that are um, in the digital world. So the red light is a particularly interesting project. Um, the artist is Huria uh, Rahimi, uh, who's Iranian. And at the time, it was uh, we we're responding to the authoritarianism that's happening in Iran. And, and her work really captured this language of the red light and extraction and violence um, towards people and also sort of this alarming aesthetic. Um, but when you change the context, um, a lot of the meaning changes. And this is something that we observed from interacting with language models and image generation uh, software at the time with her and sort of this changing in context and what does the red light means for us can mean a very different thing for things that are inhabiting the forest. So for example, um, this red light was there the entire winter and where it was sort of have this contrast and create this like warm spot where the stream underneath it was melted into kind of a little cave and People who live around the site when they're for meditation and kind of seeing the forest, um, you know, in a different way that is warm, welcoming in the dead of winter. So, really, like what is AI and how we see AI or how we train AI can be changed if we kind of situate ourselves in a different context. And this one is particularly <laughs> interesting because. Um, so the artist is Noel Perdue, who also is involved in another project that we're showing later on. Um, but her work is uh, as an internet historian and looking very deeply into the history of porn um, and algorithms that are inspired by porn, um, but ultimately being used to execute people, I guess, digitally. Um, and preventing them from inhabiting the digital infrastructure that we supposedly should all share openly. Um, so she went on to train uh, a model on 70s porn. And what was generated uh, was kind of this like mush of flesh, but nothing really appealing. Um, as we, <laughs> anyways, <laughs> but, um, and her, her first instinct is like, this is really cool. I must post it on social media. Guess what? <laughs> it got taken down immediately. Yeah. Um, and because the models that she used to train um, to generate these images are the exact models that social media use to flag content and take them down automatically. Um, so when we think about who's, who's deserving of living in this digital world. Um, there are a lot of these, I guess, back tunnels that we don't tend to think about when we design systems. And it's only through experiments like these that um, we think about you know, how these systems are designed and who's being harmed in the process. And uh, in order to share this work, <laughs> So you can't post it on Instagram or Facebook, you'll get flagged immediately. But um, reproducing it as a proxenoscope, 
So it's kind of like a real life GIF scenario, like you spin it and then it plays the animation. Um, that helped us post on social media. So, <laughs> um, yeah, and then that's essentially how you will have to watch this um, and not be censored. So this work in the forest kind of, I guess, inspired other works that we're thinking about um, in terms of infrastructure and how we collaborate as artists. Um, we, so this work emerged out of COVID and the pandemic while a lot of artists are out of work and then we're being forced to use corporate platforms that don't necessarily serve kind of the patterns that we are used to collaborating. And so Haifa Cooperative, art, the Artistic Intelligence Lab, lab <laughs> in Toronto and us got together um, to essentially create this platform where we imagine new ways of collaborating digitally. Um, so this is one of the response that we got from our time in London last year doing research. And there is a lot of emphasis um, on productivity, efficiency, and all the values of capitalism that came out at the time. Um, and I feel like everyone also have this unspoken fear about like during COVID, like is this going to be forever? Are we going to be on this corporate-led digital platform like Zoom or Miro or Google Docs uh, forever. So for us, what's interesting is that all these, um, although it seems inescapable, um, if we try or attempt to create another system to inhabit, it might not be great, it might not be as efficient, it might not be as smooth, but it is something that we can learn and create new cultures um, for this digital infrastructure to be ours. The starting point for us was, um, again, imagine a world where infrastructure might not be, infrastructure as we know it might not be stable in the future of climate change, authoritarianism, and um, there are chances where artists might need to evacuate from those situations that, you know, this the current infrastructure might not allow. I was just in China um, and I have things to say that I don't want to say. <laughs> but uh, my feeling is that every time I go back, um, I feel like the, the identity of me is increasingly solidified. There's no way for me to escape from what the data set they collected about me. Um, so if I want to change who I am, I cannot. <laughs> And this is uh, one of the, the reasons why we decided to, um, I guess, reimagine kind of a platform that doesn't form around your identity or who you are on the internet, um, but from the artifact that you leave um, and creating these moments where you can evacuate the system by deleting everything cleanly or cleaning your browser cache, um, or even just saving everything on a USB stick and you know wipe your computer and give it to someone else. Um, but we don't want to do it in a way where it feels like this is something you do in a scary scenario, <laughs> but we want to turn this into more of a collaboration, a game. So when you, you know, like when you see this infrastructure, oh, well, I guess this digital platform, you don't think about all the dire situations that you're going to be in, but um, you think about the people that are around you, collaborating with you, you're making this easier for them and safer for them. Um, so, so this is a diagram of like kind of where we are. Um, we, the yellow part is things that are currently kind of ready to test. Um, we are doing something at five. Uh, so please find us and <laughs> the yellow part are ready to test. And then the green parts are things that we are bringing in to here uh, for the next week or so to get, I don't know, your feedback, input, support, in, interest, and 
yeah, just more chats around how we can use this platform um, or this <coughs> principle, like organizing principle for things like, you know, like a AI training at AI or engaging with multiple modalities of input and using different sensors to kind of build this um, more contextualized world around collaboration. So yeah, so here's the prototype. It's built on a protocol called EarthStar, um, which it favors more of the database and server side of things rather than kind of the, the actual, I guess, tracking people side of things. Um, so in order to communicate, you will have to be able to have your own server, and then you give people access to your, well, the, the address of your server, and then a code um, as the keys to access your files. So you can take out your server, and people no longer have access to your files anymore. Um, so so the, these are the interesting sides of this project is sort of creating these openings for you to evacuate from your identity, um, both from, I think creatively speaking, that's a very interesting point of view as well, because um, at the time we're also seeing a lot of the Web3 things coming up and then people are obsessed with like, this is a thing, <laughs> this is a solid thing that you can own, but it's not. Um, so, so kind of as a response to that, what about what happens if we surrender our identity as artists or signatures as artists? Like, what does the work mean? And if it's not attached to us? So, so yeah, so these are kind of the questions that we're asking um, and sort of creating ways to situate our works around making sense of the systems that are out there um, and creating these like very non-efficient ways of engaging with the system. So, so yeah, that's, that's the extent of my work. Um, the more practical side <laughs> is Kasra, so welcome Kasra. <laughs> oh, it got cut off, oh. that's okay. Hi everyone, I'm Kasra. I'm the prototyping lead uh, for Rukai Projects and my role is basically what Jerry and Luisa do. I make it happen. I bring it to real world so we do prototyping and also I work on our uh, event side of things so public facing uh, stuff and doing different events at our space uh, that we got which I'll talk about um, later on. Uh, but this, this image, which is cut off a bit, um, this is from our uh, Carnival of Algorithmic Culture, which is um, our carnival is basically our festival that we do every year. Um, the first iteration was uh, this past June. The next one is going to be next, uh, next October uh, for the duration of a week. Last one was only two days. The next one is going to be a week. And we have talks, workshops, um, performances, uh, party, different different things. Um, in this past iteration, we had over 40 artists. Uh, we had from UK, from Germany, from um, US, and across Canada. And uh, we had talks and workshops during the day, and we had uh, performances at night. Um, and this was, this was an example of all these ideas uh, that we talked about so far coming together in different forms. We showed some of our works as well alongside uh, the artists. And I just wanted to show you some images from there. We had our performances and this was, we, we collaborated with the warehouse in Toronto. This was before we had our own space uh, and we did the festival there. <laughs> And we had about, I think it was eight, eight installations in the space. And during the night, we would turn it into a performance uh, space. Um, yeah, and this is, so this here is our uh, new space that we got. Uh, we're leasing it in Toronto, downtown Toronto. It's about 7,000 square feet, which is I think 600 square meter uh, kind of thing. And we share it with a theater company and a vodka distillery company, Vodka, uh, which is nice. We, all, we have our sponsored vodkas for our events. 
Um, well, we've named it uh, the bridge because there was a development that was going to be built uh, in place of this uh, this venue. It was going to be called uh, the bridge, and that's that's where the name comes from. Also, this in the middle. There were desks uh, here. It was a marketing company before. We removed them and we called this the bridge um, as well. Um, but yeah, we just moved in here at the end of August. Um, so we're we're doing different things there. We're doing uh, free workshops, um, free uh, talks, free hangouts, and based on anarchist uh, Sp <coughs> Spanish anarchist schools. Um, so we invite everyone to just bring in what they what they want to do or talk about different things uh, that they want to work on <clears throat> and we hang out and there was a there's a lot of different collaboration that has come out of this we do we do our uh, ground game to, uh, every couple of weeks every monday which is followed by a dj workshop and out of that dj workshop we've found so many interesting people we're doing a harm reduction workshop when we go back uh, to toronto and we're doing different experimental music improvisation sessions as well at the same time. Um, and yeah, this is, these were the two things that I wanted to talk about. And also in the prototyping uh, sense, when we want to work on projects, uh, it's basically we think of ideas and then we um, kind of see the open source AI models that are accessible. Uh, we work with those, and then if you want to develop an idea further, then we would go and work with the developers that we have uh, in our roster. And yeah, I just want to leave some time for questions as well. Um, yeah. Oh yeah, the ground, the ground game. And uh, I'll hand it to Jerry to talk about the game that's going to be next Wednesday and Thursday here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Jump in one more step here. Um, oh, perfect. Yes. So. Um, we do a lot of work with AI uh, in our practice. And um, so one way we think about this is uh, we can ask, like, what does a road do? Um, and a road obviously is there to allow people to get from place to place. Um, roads are built for cars. And so there are certain assumptions built into the infrastructure of roadworks. And I don't know how many of you know this, but when automobiles were first introduced into the road system, people were unused to the speed that the cars were moving at. And so they were getting hit. And they were getting hurt. And so what do you do when your technology is causing harm to people? Well, you lobby the government to make a law. And so jaywalking and traffic laws came out of the automotive industry petitioning the government to change the law so people would stop walking onto the road without looking. Um, so rather than actually dealing with the implications of the infrastructure, they sort of regulated the infrastructure so that people would be at fault if harm was created. Uh, what does social media do? And what does social media mean? Like, well, what does it do? It allows you to stay connected. It allows you to talk to people, to meet new people. What does it mean? Well, social media means that there are sides to an issue. Um, that the best way to contest important issues of our time is through 140 characters uh, written in text to strangers behind avatars. Um, that polarization is a positive. The algorithm loves engagement of any type. That attention is actually the measure of worth and value. What does it do and what does it mean are different things. And so with AI, we're really interested in what does AI do, but we're also interested in what does AI mean. And overwhelmingly, AI is designed with efficiency and size in mind. It does things faster and it does things bigger. So we thought, maybe we can do something a bit different. So ground is like, a, I don't know how many of you, this is a question no one ever raises their hand to, but how many of you know Dungeons and Dragons? Yeah, there's some enthusiasm there. So this is like our version of this. It's like an art version of Dungeons and Dragons. Um, it's, I want to say it's like guided, but that's wrong. It's accompanied by an AI that is extremely unhelpful. So the original research was, um, so mo most AI is, is designed with a particular phenomenology of time. Like linear time is assumed, right? Um, not all cultures and not all times believe that time is a straight line, right? There are circular models of time. And in fact, most of the world was dominated by circular models of time for a very long time. Um, and the reason for that, of course, is if you watch the sunset and sunrise, if you watch the seasons change, you know, this is the routine you see in the world. So we wanted to train an AI that had a nonlinear model of time centered. 
uh, and then trained it on the game that we developed. And it makes for a wonderful and confusing interaction with this thing. The game itself is about an idea that wants to be finalized, that wants to be embedded in the world. And your role as a player is to figure out whether or not you want to help this entity to do that. Um, and it's, it, it's technically, mechanically, if you ever, I don't know what they call them here. We call them cootie catchers. You know what I'm talking about? Does anyone know what they're called here? Yeah. Uh, they're like fortune tellers. Oh, fortune tellers. There we are. Yeah, they're whirly birds in Japan. They're, they're cootie catchers. Cooties are, are uh, a thing that young boys have that girls are <laughs> afraid of, but cootie catcher. And then you use the cootie catcher to ask questions of people that maybe you've just met. Um, and then the results of those questions then direct the, the shape of the gameplay. So Ground was developed um, to sort of help people make a home in the world, drawing on more vernacular rituals and interactions, uh, and then guided or not guided by an extremely unhelpful AI. And unfortunately, the game is meant to be distributed by uh, a seven foot tall goat, which we have a costume for, but it was very hard to bring the goat costume to, to Bristol. So if you want to see pictures of the goat, we can do that as well. So um, at 5 o'clock today, we'll be sharing the Restructuring Futures platform, or just talk to Louisa, or go to the link that was there. Uh, Restructuring Futures, it, it works, it's functional. Um, Intelligent Terrain was shared a little bit. And Ground, we are going to be sharing at 5, but also we're going to be playing it out in the cafe on Wednesday and Thursday from 10 AM to 4 PM. You don't have to stay for the whole time. You can just pop in. Uh, the first 10 people that come in each day also get a free copy of the game itself. Uh, it's a Riso printed thing. It's, it's really quite beautiful. Um, so if you like games, this is something we're looking at. And it's just a chance to sort of experience some of the things that we do. So I think we'll stop there. Um, and we'll sort of open it up to questions. I know it's a lot, and it kind of comes in. Um, but I would love to respond to anything you have to ask. So thank you. Amazing. Thank you. Um, just so you know, <laughs> <laughs> we say it's a Q&A. It can be questions. It can be inspiring things you've seen that relate that you want to share. Um, it can be anything, really, that you want to share. Um, and just to let you know, if you've got a question in the room, I'll bring the mic to you. It won't amplify your voice in the space, but it'll allow people online to be able to hear what you're saying. So if you can kind of hold it up to your mouth and speak up, um, that would be great. Um, did anybody have anything to begin with? I'm sorry if this is a mean or a hard question, but... We like those. <laughs> <laughs> um, Bristol has a lot of stuff. It wasn't really touched on in the presentation, but around um, kind of approaches to um, drug and alcohol. Mm. Uh, Bristol has a lot of innovative um, kind of responses to those like, issues. Um, a lot of cities in Canada are impacted by uh, fentanyl. It would be interesting to hear your guys' perspective or yeah. kind of, or to hear about what's happening or, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we, we actually, in all our events, we have a harm reduction team that's always, um, there's like five, six of them and also us as well, we're all trained to respond to overdoses uh, and all that and also providing a safe space uh, in the like making sure everyone is good uh, throughout the event and also we're doing a series of uh, which the first one is november 20th we're starting a series of harm reduction workshops alongside our dj workshops so all the and all of these are free so people can come and learn and we'll give them a free i don't know if here it's called naloxone kit as well it will give them a free naloxone kit and like safe party like drug use or like different packs that like I don't know for like having sex in the bathroom safely or like doing drugs safely during the event or like different things like that. That's uh, we do that for all of our events. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, the fentanyl uh, situation, especially in west of Canada, is a is a big uh, in BC is a big problem and also in Toronto as well, everywhere, but yeah, yeah, West is more, but yeah, yeah. Can I ask a quick follow-up yeah. question? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, take that, Mike. <laughs> uh, would you say there's kind of political will for the harm reduction approach, um, like you're saying with the naloxone and yeah. kind of the safer, safer mm -hmm. drug use and the safer sex, is there kind of the uh, political support or like funding support for that kind of thing? 
Um, or is it more just communi communities responding yeah. to the issues? No, I think I think it's uh, it's more uh, communities because I mean my background because I, I take care of organizing the uh, that part of things. I come from the punk scene uh, in Canada, so always punks. We always take care of each other. Um, so it, it comes from the punk uh, and anarchist <laughs> side of things. But um, I mean. There's not funding. I mean, naloxone kits are free, but people don't know that it's free in Canada. I don't know how it is here, uh, but you can get it for free in um, pharmacies and you can uh, get trained for that and stuff as well. Um, we don't do it for political reasons, but yeah, there it might be some people might do it, but we, we do it just because we see that we need to do it. Yeah. <laughs> And just to say, if you're watching online as well, if you can pop your um, questions or thoughts in the YouTube chat and Emma will speak them out in the room for you here today. Did anyone have anything else? Well, I had a quick question while everyone's having some thoughts on that. Um, I was really interested in the shipwreck quote that you um, mentioned at the beginning. And I just wondered if you could say maybe a little bit more about that approach and how it's permeating your work. Yeah, can do. Um, yeah, so I, I <laughs> this is always a difficult question because there are, are, are communities that are experiencing shipwreck um, as, a, as a quality of their existence. Um, and that's often because they are, are on the margins of, of what a society wants to invest time and attention into. Um, so to actually actively promote shipwreck um, can feel um, like it, it can feel sort of dangerous, um, but we we do worry that the the infrastructures we're in insulate us from the harm that we're creating for ourselves and future generations, and the individual capacity to be able to respond to those moments of uncertainty or not knowing, um, we we kind of lose that muscle over time. Um, because we become accustomed to, to having certain things that we may not have. Um, I, my daughter's 14, and you know she's telling me what job should I have in the future, and I'm like, I don't even know what that world's going to look like. Like, it's it's hard to imagine the kinds of systems that will be necessary to be able to deal with that. And so the sort of culture for what's coming is an invitation to say, well, like the art world currently is built on art as a product, as a commodity, or as a spectacle. Um, it's something to be sold or it's something to draw attention to. Is that necessary when we're dealing with climate harm? Is that helpful when we're dealing with authoritarianism? Probably not. Um, but there are strong interests that sort of want to preserve that. And so we're, we're interested in how do we at least make visible the fact that we're, that we're working within systems and assumptions that, that may not actually make, help us respond to, to, to the world that, that we're actively producing each and every day. Um, I think it's also a bit of shock value with shipwreck um, because we naturally assume that shipwreck is a, this awful thing. Um, and, and of course it is, but I think it's this idea that, I don't know if it's true here, but in Canada, we have a lot of problems with forest fires. Um, and one of the reasons, of course, is, is global warming. But the other is that over history, fires, small fires would allow for the fuel that create big fires to be dissipated. But when we actually hold off on those big, those small fires happening, we have these massive, massive fires. Um, and so shipwreck is this idea of like, how do we start a lot of small fires, maybe through culture, through, through art, um, so that when big fires come, they, they do less harm, they move less quickly, uh, or we feel equipped to be able to respond. Sorry, right, Pigeon was just slipping on the glass there. But <laughs> um, yeah, I hope, I hope that answers it. But yeah, thank that's you. amazing. Thank you. And with your events, which look completely awesome, is there, um, do you do any of those kind of hybrid or online? Like, would there be opportunity for people here to get involved in those in any way? Um, we, we are trying to. <laughs> We're yeah. working with our internet provider at the space. I mean, we have the means, we have the gear, but uh, our internet is not stable enough now to do it um, but we want to uh, we want to make it more hybrid and some of the events we don't want we don't necessarily want people to feel like they're being filmed by a camera or something like that um, but 
some of the workshops we want to try and actually record and archive it and or stream it online as well. But yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Thank, yeah. You. Thank you. Was there any other um, thoughts from the room online? No? Okay, well, we can wrap it up there today. Um, oh, sorry, I've got a little bit of something I have to say to you before we finish. <laughs> Um, yeah, so before we go, um, I mean, we've mentioned it already. We've got First Friday today between five and six, um, which happens here in the studio. It's our monthly social event, um, and it kind of offers opportunity for informal chats. And today, it's a chance to see more work by Ukai, which is really exciting. And there'll also be a range of fantastic projects by teams who are awarded funding through the first My World Challenge and CR&D calls which was led by Digital Catapult. So there's like a whole range of projects that are going to be shown, which are totally awesome and amazing. So hopefully some of you might be able to come along to that this afternoon. Um, if you want to stick around on Hot Desk today, you're very welcome. Or if you want to find out more, that, more about what we do, um, you can grab one of the studio team. Can you put your hand up if you're a studio team here today? So we've got Bridget, Danielle, Emma and Laura Tim in the space today. Um, and if you're watching online, if you've got any questions or thoughts that you want to follow up with, please drop us a line on studio at watershed.co.uk. Okay, thank you once again. Big round of applause. <laughs> it was amazing to hear from you. And thank you all for coming so much. And we'll see you next time. <laughs>